today. It's a beautiful day today, as always. Why? Because this is the day that the Lord has made. We're going to rejoice and be glad in it. And be glad in it. And I'm going to add to that, if you don't mind, because I do have a joke, of course. Oh, okay. Another joke. Yes, another joke. So, how do you stop a two-ton elephant from charging? A two-ton elephant from Think charging. About it. Think about it. How do you stop a two-ton elephant elephant from charging? Oh, I don't know. Okay, take away his credit card. Okay. <laughs> take away the credit card. <laughs> take away. Take away credit, credit card. card. Yeah, I don't know oh, about you. That it would was, stop. Yeah, it oh, would stop me from charging okay, yeah, and a whole I get lot of other folks too. If I you get didn't it have your credit card, right? Okay, <laughs> so that's what you're gonna do. To I stop. get it. <laughs> Good, that's good. So we just, you know, we always have such a good time on the show, but we live passion, purpose, and faith. Yes, Right, and we today do. we're gonna talk about restoration. Now, Lisa, my good friend, she is the queen of restoration in terms of, tell me what you did with that chair. Oh yeah, my I'm goodness, I wouldn't like call myself a queen, but I love restoring old things. Yeah. And I found an old chair that was like a mint green color. Yeah, yeah, But I really, I wanted a black, chair yeah and um, so the chair is mint green mm -hmm. and I got to thinking now how can I change this to be black I didn't yeah. want to upholster it yeah, what are you gonna do with mint so green? I went to one of the hobby stores and the lady told me uh -huh. to get some fabric spray paint uh -huh. so I took the fabric spray paint and painted the chair and it's now black and it's beautiful it is so if you're trying to figure wonderful. out a way to restore something that is old uh, in terms of fabric mm -hmm. or a sofa or a chair, get some fabric spray paint. You know, you talk it about works. that. I'm like, what the heck is that? And I thought I was crafty. You know, I thought it that does I, work. I really thought that I was. But today, everybody, we're going to be talking about restoration that's a whole lot deeper than the chairs and, and changing the fabric of the chair and buy. Yes. We are going to talk about this phenomenal story. So just sit down. You don't want to go anywhere. This is just going to knock your socks off. Going to bless you. From prison walls to preaching the gospel, Jojo Godinez was given life behind bars, but God had another plan. So we're going to talk today with Jojo and Daniel Godinez to share their phenomenal, amazing story of restoration. Let's welcome them to today's show. Hi, hi. Welcome, welcome. welcome. Thank you for having us. Thank hi, my dear. Thank you. How are you? Pretty good. Good to see you. Good to see, good you. To see you. Welcome, right. welcome, Jojo. Have Thank a seat. You. Have a seat. Such an amazing story. Amazing story. Oh, gosh. Um, how do you begin? I mean, how do we begin? I was going to say, how, where do we don't even know where to start? It's just phenomenal. So, you go start. Well, um, my husband um, was sentenced to prison in 1991. We were teenagers, and um, I was pregnant, and I didn't know that he was going to get sentenced when we married as a teenager. And uh, he got life in prison, and unfortunately, or fortunately, I guess, that trial, it was the gateway for us meeting Christ. Mm. Um, it was a... It was a rough time in our life, but it, it also was a, a time that changed both of our lives individually. Mm -hmm. um, we, um, we weren't saved at the time when this trial occurred, but you know, we persevered. And um, my husband, he ended up um, encountering God in, in the prison walls. And hence, that's how he was preaching to me and telling me about that I needed to find that personal relationship with Christ so that I don't feel alone or abandoned in this situation. So that's how it all started for me. I would want to tell us. We'd like to hear. Um, well, you know, my wife, she kind of caught the, the end part of you know, a transition in my life because way prior before meeting her and ever going to prison, I was already in prison with a belief system that mm -hmm. it was acceptable to be a gang member, to be a drug dealer, mm -hmm. to be a rebellious young kid in the streets of, you know, Los Angeles, um, San Gabriel Valley area. And, um, you know, before I met her, 
I think when I was probably about 14 years old, I had a four-year-old nephew who died. And um, during that time, I was already involved in gangs. And um, the death of my nephew, you know, it kind of took me to a whole different stage in my mentality of evilness. Um, at that point in time, I felt that I wasn't worthy to live. I kind of was really angry at God based on, I was like, I'm the one doing bad. Why didn't you kill me? Why did you have to take my nephew? You know, I mean, my nephew, he was like my own son because his father was in prison many years. So him and his mother, my sister lived with us. So I was kind of raising him, you know, to be a young boy, you know. And when he died, it was like a part of me died and that sent me on a rampage. And um, before I met her, like almost two years before I met her, I was involved in a gang related shooting. Um, and uh, during that time, you know, I didn't care. I had little remorse for humans, period. Um, didn't care about life at all. Mm -hmm. And um, I ended up getting arrested for the shooting and I fought it for almost a year and a half. And when I got out, I had, I had, God was kind of dealing with my heart when I didn't even know it, you know, and God's so merciful and so gracious, just so gracious to us. Mm -hmm. And even when I wasn't seeking him, I had signs of different people telling me about God's love and God's purpose for my life. And God called me to be something better than what I had been living. And uh, I didn't acknowledge it at that time. I was totally, you know, not even aware that God had something better for me in life. Wow. I always thought I was destined to die in the streets or in prison or, you know, something of that nature. And um, miraculously, after 11 months of fighting my case, um, I was let go. They actually freed me back to society. Oh, wow. Um, you know, the courts at the time, they didn't have enough evidence to proceed with my, with my trial, so mm -hmm. they let me go. And during that time, when I got out, I had promised my mom, you know, my mom was such a loving mom, and I told her, Mom, I'm going to do good this time. I'm going to go to school, mm -hmm. and I'm going to find a job, and sure. I ain't going to hang out so much. But, you know, about a day later, all of that went out the window, <laughs> and I was right back in the neighborhood with my homeboys and doing what I was doing prior. And um, something in me, though, was kind of different, though, because it was like I didn't really feel right with what I was doing, not like before I got arrested. And um, God sent me her as, as an angel in, in a weird way because when I met her, it was like looking in a mirror of the female me because I seen a lot of hurt and pain in her life. Yeah. And um, she was kind of like one of the shot callers in the girls, you know, <laughs> division <laughs> of, of the whole gang thing. And me and her, we had so much pride, you know, in the neighborhood and in, in oneself. And we would always bump heads and, you know, every, and all my homeboys used to always tell me, man, why are you even messing with her for You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> she's all hardcore and stuff. And, <laughs> but for me, though, it was like, even though we were so young, we had been through a lot. And I still remember being 16, 17 years old, you know, just just like laying down on the bed and talking about grown up stuff like, you know, let's get married and let's have a baby and let's move out of the neighborhood. And I think that was our way of maybe escaping the gang life. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Even though it seemed far fetched, you know, I think it was still there in us that let's grow up already. Mm -hmm. And this was like the signs that we knew of like a grown up, you know, mm -hmm. a family, kids and uh, an apartment, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Of course, we never thought about a house or nothing. Mm -hmm. We were, you know, thinking about an apartment and stuff. And I was doing really good in a sense as far as I started working. Um, we did end up getting married at young. She was 17. I was 17. I was 16. 16. I wow. was 17 getting, getting married. Oh um, expecting our first baby. Oh, yeah. um, all before we got married, of course, we did that in sin. You know, thank God for his mercy on our children. Um, but we ended up, you know, going along with what we had planned as far as getting her pregnant, getting married. We didn't get an apartment exactly quick enough, but we did move out of the neighborhood. My sister let us move into one of her extra rooms, a city away from ours, and we felt like we were living life, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. we, we weren't worried about our house being shot up or anything. Uh, yeah. um, she was working, I was working, we were saving money. And then um, 4th of July weekend uh, in 91, we decided to go back to the neighborhood to see my mom, because that's where my mom, my father, you know, my family mm -hmm. was still living. And during that time, um, there was a lot of, you know, gang violence still going on, even though we were gone. Mm -hmm. And me and one of my brothers, uh, I call him my brother, who's actually one of my homeboys that we kind of took off the streets, you know, and um, 
he was living with us for quite some time and we decided to walk to the store and walking out of the store a LA County Sheriff came up and asked me for ID and stuff and I gave it to him and little before I knew it he pulled out his gun and stated um, don't move stay where you're at there's a warrant you know and wow. um, for your arrest when he put me in the cop car, he told me that I was being arrested for murder. And wow. uh, I said, what? I was like, man, this is crazy. You know, you got the wrong guy. Right. And, you know, to speed up the story, I end up in the substation. I call her. I tell her, yeah, this one I'm busting for. She's her and my mom and them said, we're going to get you a lawyer. You know, don't worry. We know you didn't do nothing. And I didn't know until like 2 o'clock that morning when gang unit came into the substation cell and told me, you know, this isn't on us. You know, the district attorney from Pomona Courts, we filed on you from that crime from two years ago. Yeah. So I was like, oh, I beat that case. No big thing. So I told her, oh, don't even worry about it. I'll be out of here probably, you know, next court day or whatever. And come to find out, my crime partner from two years ago ended up testifying against me. My oh. own my own partner, my own wow. friend who, you know, signed the code of conduct of the streets as I did. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, in gang lifestyle, that's a no-no. You don't turn on your friends, you know. Mm -hmm. But anyways, what the devil meant for evil, God had another plan for my life. Mm -hmm. See, because going to jail, going to prison, this whole little setup, it saved my life. Mm -hmm. And I know that today. And God has been so great in just showing me, you know, because through that time, um, God had really, really, really just grabbed a hold of my heart, you know, in a way that was so real, you know, because like I said, I hadn't been looking for God. You know, I wasn't looking for a way of escape through him. I thought within our own ability, we could find a true happiness mm -hmm. in a family, mm -hmm. but it wasn't true happiness. And um, in that county jail, even though I was doing good, you know, prior to getting arrested again, working and not gangbanging, wasn't selling drugs, changed the way we dressed, you know, we were saving our money, everything was going good. But the moment I stepped in that county jail, all of that had to be stripped again in order to survive in the county jail system. Sure, that's right. You know, the whole racist face had to come on, the gangbanging face, the disregarding human life had to come back. And I was, I mean, when probation and the courts identified me as a predator against human beings because that was the nature I was living, you know, that was, that was the identity I had to put back on. As a young man, gang member, I had older guys that knew I was facing life, and they take advantage of that. Really? They take advantage of a young kid coming in that was gangbanging in the streets as a soldier, a warrior, a torpedo is what they called, mm -hmm. is what they called me. Mm -hmm. You know, they set the course and they fired me and I would go. Wow. And, um, I ended up doing something. I ended up committing another crime within the county jail and I got sent to the hole. And I was by myself. There was no one was around nothing. I mean, they would slide my food under my under my cell. Oh, man. And that was the only contact I had with people. Oh man. But it was there that God really dropped me to my knees where I realized, you know, that, you know, I don't deserve to be alive. I'm a nasty human being, you know. And I had thoughts of suicides, you know, and the only thing that kept me from even trying to kill myself at that point in time was my pride. I had enough pride in me to think that what would they say if I killed myself? You know, he went out like a coward or he was a sissy. And I was so concerned about what they were going to say about me being dead, you know. And I said, well, OK, let me think of a master plan. When I get out of this hole, I'm going to make it to where the cops kill me because, you know, I've seen that before. You know, I just got to do something dumb and they'll definitely kill me. But in that whole process of giving up is when God stepped in and gave me hope. In a strange way, I didn't see no uh, Virgin Mary. I didn't see no <laughs> bright lights, no thunder, no loud voice. Walls didn't shake or nothing. Oh but something within my spirit said, I'm not done with you. Wow. And um, I, I don't think I could ever verbally just express what took place within them moments. You know, because I didn't have no preacher. I didn't even have a Bible with me at the mm -hmm. time. But I had some sort of knowledge of God from being brought up in a Catholic church, never devoted or nothing, but I heard about God. I heard about Jesus, you know what I mean? A whole lot about the Virgin Mary, of course. But at this point in time, it was like something just tugged at my heart to fall on my knees and ask God for forgiveness. Wow. I didn't know about, you know, the sinner's prayer. I didn't know about repentance. I didn't know anything other than that, you know, there's a God. I didn't know him per se. I just knew there was a God. There was a, a being that was greater than myself. Mm -hmm. 
And I fell on my knees that morning. Um, this was after, I'd say morning, because that night when I was t being tug of war in my heart, I was cussing out God, actually, <laughs> in the nighttime. Mm -hmm. I was so mad at God for, I was telling God, you know, why my life? Why did my family have to be drug addicts and gang members? And why did my nephew have to die? And why, you know, why did you allow me to get my life together and then you bring me right back into this hellhole? I was getting ready to be a father. I just become a husband and man, life was going good. I was living a good life and you took me away from that and put me back in this hell hole. Mm -hmm. And never did I think that it was a place of preserving my life and restoring my life wow. because it was then that God taught me how to be a man. You know, people look at 13 years of incarceration as a waste of time, but for me and my wife can, you know, confirm it that, you know, during that time, a lot of the friends I ran with, they all died. Mm -hmm. The friends that happened to stay alive, when I came home, they were still living in their mom's garage, doing drugs, drinking, and didn't have no, nothing to show for themselves. I'm not judging them, but I was down that line. Mm -hmm. But I came home, you know, with a college education. I got saved. Amen. I had three trades under oh my, my belt. Goodness. I had taken hours of parenting. I got, I mean, life skills. Wow. I yeah. mean, everything that I was going to need in order to step out. And I had pastor friends that used to tell me, I know you're doing life, Jojo, and I know you don't have no date of release or anything like that, but keep your bags packed because mm -hmm. God's going to bring you out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. And, I, you know, it was man. hard to believe at first yeah. because I see men there that were already incarcerated 40 years, 30-some years, and they had the same sentence. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't see myself stepping out, but through faith I could believe that God was able to, and not only able but wanting. Mm -hmm. And... Um, I believe that God had called a purpose, had really started to develop a purpose in my life in there because even while in prison, I first started tutoring, you know, one-on-one -on -one people with like English and stuff. And to top it off, I didn't even graduate from high school. I mean, going in there, how am I going to tutor somebody? I mean, of course, through my time in there, I ended up graduating from the California Youth Authority where I first started. But um, I started tutoring people. Then I started having one-on-one -on -one Bible studies. And eventually oh, wow. it promoted to me being a yard pastor where we would have church services out on the yard. And, um, oh, you know, numbers goodness. continued to increase. And there was miracles and healings. And <clears throat> there was all kinds of signs and wonders that only God could be glorified in. You know, that yes. people knew that I'm just an inmate like you guys. But God was healing people miraculously. And People that, you know, had been known to be devils on them yards were getting saved. Wow. And uh, oh I was goodness. just a humble servant through it all, just being a vessel of God. And through that time, I had become content with my ministry there. I had become content with my time. You know, I was always hurt that my wife would have to travel long distances with a newborn baby up into the age of 12 years old. You know, that, that would hurt me. But at the same time, I kind of felt that that was just the plan of God, you know, because mm -hmm. through me being there, she ended up getting saved, you know, and her brother got saved, became a pastor through oh everything that God was doing. Mm -hmm. So I b believe that, you know, this is God's plan and his purpose for my life to evangelize right here in the places I am. Wow. And then um, when amazing. I started to go before the board of prison terms, um, I wasn't expecting a release. Uh, there were some times where I wasn't too Christian just because of the frustrations of dealing with the governor and the board of prison terms. I would go in there not so humble. I would go in there and be like, this is a waste of time. I already know it's been all over the media, the news. You guys ain't paroling anyone with life. Mm -hmm. You guys already openly said that the only way we're getting out of here is in a pine box. Mm -hmm. And as I said, so stop wasting my time. I got a ministry to fulfill. Get, get me back to the yard. You know, <laughs> Let's stop going through all this. Amen. And God really, really dealt with me. And he said, where's your humility yet? Um, and, and where's your faith that I'm able um, to? I got a year denial. They usually deny you either three years, two years, or one year. I got a one-year denial and went back the following year, completely different attitude. In 2003, I go before the governor's commissioners, which was a panel of three, and God told me to be still and see his salvation. And I, and I remembered, you know, where that was quoted in the Bible, you know what I mean? When he was telling Moses, you know, yeah. I'm, I'm about to do something. That's right. And when he told me that, I had a paid attorney that came in and told me, we're going to have to postpone it because I don't like these commissioners. They're never favorable towards gang members. And, you know, it's, it doesn't look good. Doesn't look good. So let's just postpone it for another. I said, no, God already spoke. We need to go forward. <gasps> She oh, said, wow. okay, this decision is on you, though. Okay, You're paying okay. me to represent right. you. I'm telling you my, you know, 
as an attorney what mm -hmm. we should do. And uh, I said, nope, God already spoke. We need to go forward. And as soon as we stepped in, it was like no other hearing that I had been in. And I had been in like five different hearings prior to this. And the commissioners had always been known to badmouth me and tell me, you know, you're a menace to society, da 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 da, and you know, all your life you had this crime, this crime, this crime, and they read off all my profile from a mm -hmm. juvenile. And then I'd have LA County's uh, district attorney on the phone representing and telling all the same stuff they just told me. And um, I ended up just like, this time in though, this time in though, they said, how you do? They knew me by name and everything because they were the commissioners from a year before. They said, how you doing? I hope everything's well with you. Just for the record, you know, is there anything else that you want to add to the facts? And I was like, you know, I've already pretty much said everything I had to say concerning my case. I can't change what I did when I was 16 years old. I'm 31 now. I, I said all of that. I can't change it. All I can change is who I am. Yeah. And I believe my file, you know, reflects that. Mm -hmm. And uh, they said, OK, we just, you know. We have the district attorney. The district attorney says, we believe he's paid his dues to society. And I'm like, wait, usually they're like bad rapping me bad. And this time around, they're telling me, you know, they're exalting me. And the commissioners start to exalt me. And, um, you know, they go through their whole little hearing and they tell me to go back into the holding tank while they deliberate and come back with their finding, which is either a granted parole or a denial of parole. Usually I would go back, they would call me back in in five minutes and say, okay, you're, you've been denied parole because of such and such mm -hmm. grounds. You know, you haven't did no educational classes. You had a write-up, mm -hmm. you had this or whatever. But this time I'm in there for like almost an hour and a half and it's already nighttime and usually they're gone already like by five o'clock and it's nighttime. The guard comes and offers me an extra dinner and I'm like, why are they taking so long? Did they leave or something? And <laughs> I had no idea what was happening because usually they would take me back there like 10 minutes and bring me right back in and give me my denial. So this time around, uh, I go back in and they said, um, on behalf of the state of California, we find you suitable for parole. And they start reading my parole conditions. And I'm telling my attorney, what is she? And she's like, wait a minute, wait, be quiet, be quiet. And she's writing down everything and they say, good luck. You know, uh, we hope wow. you the best. So I, I'm like, what just happened? Oh, and just like wow. in the movies, when they stamp the paper, oh, granted parole, yes. they stamp it. And I'm like, what just happened? You know, oh, my they give me my copy. I have it. I go back to the prison yard. I tell everybody, everybody's excited and oh, happy and jubilant. Everybody's happy that God's moving. Wow. But 140 days later, oh, I get a letter from the governor's office saying that my parole was being overturned oh. because of the callousness of my offense and, um, you know, the commission that it was uh, committed in and the benefit of a gang and this and that. And, you know, I kind of was like, eh, I kind of figured something like this, you know. And um, I was like, I don't even know how to tell them because they were already excited oh, so about I was your, planning my party party coming home, home party. Yeah. <laughs> I, I didn't even want to call her and tell her. Oh, I told yeah. the people that were in the prison, the counselors that I was um, working with at that time. And um, it was a program. It was actually a drug program that I had been hired on as, as a mentor. Mm -hmm. And this program, Walden House, they actually got um, mm -hmm. attorneys and stuff out of San Francisco to come represent me. They told me, you know what, Joe, enough is enough. We're fighting the governor. And I was like, who am I that they would mm -hmm. want to do wow. all this for? Mm -hmm. And um, I oh think it goodness. was a few months later. I was found suitable in... in in March, March 3rd, 2003, I was found suitable for parole. Mm -hmm. uh, come August, I had an appeals uh, review in Sacramento that I wasn't allowed to go, mm -hmm. but I could have character witnesses. Mm -hmm. This is when my family went up to Sacramento in the governor's office to speak to the commissioners, mm -hmm. which was a panel of seven. They only had five minutes to speak on my behalf. I had about 10 or 12 different witnesses that mm -hmm. flew up there to talk on my behalf. Mm -hmm. While they were in Sacramento, I'm out on the yard playing basketball, and I had a counselor that was coming out. Jojo, your wife just testified. Your pastor just talked, oh and my. your kid had everybody oh. in tears. So he's giving me reports, and I'm still playing. Later on that night, 8 o'clock at night, that night, counselors are all gone already at 4 o'clock. I had an attorney. Um, the counselor calls me in the office and says, you're going home tomorrow morning. Oh my I said, what? And she had no idea. Oh my so goodness. I call her and tell them I'm coming home. And they said, are you sure? I said, yes. They called me. I even talked to the warden. The warden mm -hmm. called me and told me, congratulations, you're going home. Mm -hmm. And um, everyone in the prison was all excited. And they were just, they couldn't believe it. Oh and that morning, uh, 
they ended up calling my name after they had already called everyone else that was being released. They called me probably about four hours later, and I thought, oh, man, okay, it's still not happening. Mm -hmm. wow. Everything was so dramatic leading up to, to me leaving. And when I finally did step out, you know, uh, they were having a going away ceremony for me. Uh, and it seemed like, oh, my goodness, it seemed like the whole prison yard of like 900 people were at the door waiting for me to walk wow. out the building to, to the release gates. Oh, wow. I had, you know, white gang members and Northern California gang members, and I had Crips and Bloods and Skin. And everybody was there telling me bye because, you know, they knew that I was the yard passer. I was also one of the mentors wow. there. Oh, my and they were seeing a miracle. I was the first lifer to parole from New Corcoran State Prison. Wow. And then, you know, the journey began with me and my beautiful wife Absolutely. being reunited. Mm -hmm. and well, if we can just ask one last question, uh, and I want to ask you, Dahlia, what would you tell a wife that's in waiting, mm -hmm. uh, who possibly are, have walked in the shoe, are walking in the shoes that you guys mm -hmm. have walked in? I would just in. tell her, trust in God and, and um, find a good church if you're not serving God. And, mm -hmm. and every time the doors are open, you go to the church doors and you get fed because during this time it's your storm you need strength you need uh, believers to to be there to lift you up mm -hmm. to pray for you to pray for your situation and to intercede because God is no respecter of persons and I've always thought that because of the gang life that I was always the least of these but you know mm -hmm. God loves mm. each and every one of us, he does. Um, and He cares. He cares. And for many years, I believed the lie about um, not not being loved by Christ because I felt like I was uh, dealt a bad deck of cards, and because of you know the lack of relationship that I didn't have with Christ. But when you get into a good church and a good Bible believing church, mm -hmm. you just stay steadfast, read your Bible pray and most importantly in your weak times you allow people to to intercede for you mm -hmm. and have a good a good circle to to lift you up because that's what helped me even when I was lack of faith you know because of a lot of years maybe he's never coming home maybe and believing the lie but you know what God said different and mm -hmm. we believe him so and we stand in the in the in the truth of his word and knowing that everything works together for good to those mm -hmm. that love God and that are called according to his purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Well, it's just I don't know what to say. I know we don't we don't oh even goodness. have words. This just in a phenomenal, amazing story of the power of God and restoration. We see we told you this is much deeper than a chair. Yes. <laughs> this is this is the real mm -hmm. restoration. Yes, and we is. just just thank you guys for coming today and thank you so and much sharing that story. Your your powerful testimony. Wow. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank, thank you. you. Absolutely. Any hope that we can give uh, to those that are in our situation or or are going through the same thing, I mean it's it's a blessing for us to give that hope because um, sometimes you feel like right. you've been whatever's on paper is what it is mm -hmm. and we could believe outside of the box and say yeah. you know what God has the final word God has, has the, the final, final word yep. well there you have it and again this is I live and we live passion purpose and faith mm -hmm.